reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5, Church Order. This epistle is written by Paul to his disciple Timothy, uh, his son in the faith, and he's been helping him to adjust to the very large responsibility of pastoring a church in Ephesus. Ephesus was a good-sized church in a very pagan community with a lot of uh, sin going on. The uh, temple worship of Artemis was there, and uh, they had all kinds of uh, false doctrine, prostitution, all kinds of things going on. And the church was struggling to maintain purity and order. And the advice here is for Timothy himself and also for his church. We saw as we got into chapter 1 that he was commending them for the good work that they were doing, their stand of faith, and that they should continue to fight the good fight. Don't give up. Uh, he mentioned in uh, chapter 2 about order in the church, that the men in verse 1 ought to get their hands up and start worshiping the Lord. And, uh, and uh, he mentioned also that... Um, we should, all be, uh, we should all be praying, men and women, praying for those in authority. And uh, you mentioned, as far as the order is concerned, that the men should be praying, verse 8, and getting their hands up. The ladies in verse 9 should not be trying to just impress with their clothes, but have a, have a humble spirit. Uh, then he talked about what appears to be a particular problem with some woman in the church, because he goes into the singular there instead of the plural, verse 11. There's a woman who was apparently speaking out and being disruptive, and she needed to be able to be quiet. Um, and uh, Paul talks about not permitting a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a general policy for all churches that women can't teach because they can prophesy, they can pray, and, uh, and they can teach. In, but in it, the would also, it would also contradict many other oh, scriptures yeah. in the Bible. And um, our friend Pastor Paul had sent me a, a Bible the Baptist Bible, believe me, that he uses. And even in the commentaries that said the same thing, it would contradict. So you have to be careful. People take one scripture and they want to beat you over the head with it. Walk into the church, put your head down and never talk. That's right. You have to be very careful about that. And so there are many examples in the church, in the Old Testament, New Testament, women who are teaching. Uh, we see... Uh, uh, Deborah is a judge and a pronouncer of the law. We have uh, Hilda. Hilda was a prophetess who proclaimed the uh, genuine certification of the Bible. And uh, other examples, Esther, who takes authority to deliver the Jews. In the New Testament, you've got Anna, who is speaking of the Lord Jesus. She's a woman who's 84 years of age. And uh, you've got the Apostle Paul talks about a number of women uh, in the Romans as well, who are apostles or teachers or have pastors of their churches in their houses. Many, many examples of it. And um, personally, I'll just say that I'm, I'm grateful that our church has been liberated from the male-only uh, teaching that I was taught in seminary. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, we've got to pray for those churches that are still in bondage, and especially the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, because they are riddled right now with a male-dominated approach towards covering up sexual sins, even as the Roman Catholic Church has been struggling with covering up the sexual sins of their priests as well. So it's time for us to have a more liberated view, as the rest of the world is, that women are important. They are to be uh, allowed to do all things in the church that God calls them to do. We don't choose a woman because she's a woman. We just choose the right person. And... Um, I have one regret in ministry. My mother asked me a number of times to please ordain her to the pastorate, but I was uh, too much uh, 
involved with the Baptist movement in my seminary, and there, I denied that to her, and I'm so, so, so sad about that. But we've ordained women since then, including my wife, Kelly. When I get to heaven, I'm going to say, Mother, I love you, and I'm sorry that I was so naive about that. But um, we, we need the women's perspective. Um, I was listening to somebody that Veronica sent me a, a testimony of some guy. I don't know who he was. He's a fast talker. I played it for you, I think, a week or so ago. But he talked about his wife, and every man can smile about this. He said, I, I, I looked at my wife. She was hot. She was beautiful. And, and I married her. And, and I love her. But for the first 10 years, I thought she was pretty much out to lunch because her ideas were so, so far out. And I just thought she had no ability to reason. Uh, and then about the 10th year, I began to realize, well, she's making a lot of sense, and she's uh, saying things that are true. And then I began to realize that I needed to listen to her more. And then he said something which was new to me. He said, I have that red glass and that blue glass. You know what a red, red lens and a blue lens does in, in glasses? I Remember when that. we went to the movies? We were a little 3D? Red and blue together makes it 3D. And as I began to listen to her, our relationship became more 3D, became more intimate, and... Uh, uh, and uh, one one flesh. So Kelly has added to this church. She has had things here that she's added that I but thought were ridiculous. But you've changed me too. Well, that's, and, um, and it, Anthony Michelle, uh, 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 my son and his uh, his girlfriend, they were together like 13 years. I thought they'll never make it. I mean, I thought, boy, that was terrible. And they got married. And I'm telling you, since they got married, we we really felt in our heart, you need to get married. They got married. Not that they haven't had any struggles, but they have become one flesh. And I, I, I say things to him now, and I go, well, what does Michelle think about it? He goes, oh my gosh, she's right on it. They're fasting last week. They're doing this. They're really grown. And the thing is, um, I said, well, that's that one flesh thing. Like Jerry and I have changed so much that I've taken on some of his beliefs. He's taken on some of mine. We've kind of come together on a lot of things. I have to say, there's almost nothing we disagree about we really but that's that one flesh you know no. you start to something happens like something happens he got, I got in me and I got in him and it just changed yeah. and I was reading the other day on nonprofit organizations uh, especially in churches women in leadership have about maybe 20 percent of the roles and they do 85 percent of the work now it's about time to get this uh, a little bit more equal women be all that you can be and uh, let the Lord uh, uh, open up uh, ministries for you. The Assemblies of God, I think, had it right all along, where they have husbands and wives as pastors in the church. And you've got the woman's perspective and the man's perspective, just like in the family. It's good to have both. In any event, that's for each church to decide. Let's get into today's discussion of church order. Uh, he's now going from talking about Timothy, per se, to pretty much uh, the people in that church. And let's see how that applies today. Church order, it involves relating properly to various groups in your church. And Kelly's going to open us in prayer. Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, scripture that we're going to read. We ask that you would anoint Pastor Jerry and, and help me, Lord, to uh, be able to bring forth any ideas or things that you have to say to us through this word. Prepare the hearts of the people so that they will understand about church order and help us, Lord, to be people of order. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I will be speaking. Kelly will be speaking. The Holy Spirit will be speaking. And remember what John said, you have no need that any man or woman should teach you. You have the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'll tell you some of the best teaching that I ever did. That's right. I never did. Pastor, that thought that you had today was fabulous. What was the thought that I had? <laughs> it was so-and-so. Oh, that's great. I never heard that before. Well, it turns out I never said it, but the Holy Spirit said it while I was teaching. So open up to the Holy Spirit, and he will let you know if uh, he Come agrees, Holy if he disagrees, Spirit. or he wants to add some new thoughts to it. He is the only teacher we need to listen to. Come Amen. Chapter 5, verse 1. Let's talk about church order concerning various age groups. Let's look at verses uh, 1 and 2 as we talk about how in the church to treat men, in verse 1, and women in verse 2. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. So it's, this is basic not just for church, but in society, in a family. He says as far as the older man, that's somebody who's on the, on the uh, 
short end of the age stick, the older that would be type, you. that would be me. <laughs> Uh, we should not be uh, too direct and too heavy with them. We so should never try to rebuke them and bring them down, but exhort them, encourage them, and be diplomatic when you and gentle when you deal with somebody who's older. Treat them as you would your father. And then as uh, the younger men, you can be more direct. Again, never be abusive, but you can talk straight with the young fellows and say, hey, knock it off, let's do this, let's do that, or you're doing a great job. So uh, just be, be careful how you deal with people by age. Uh, the older women, treat them as your mothers. You know, just treat them with respect and, uh, and love them. and honor them and deference when necessary and appropriate. With the younger women, you treat them, and this is so important, it's so important, this is where a lot of troubles come in a church. Younger women, you treat them as sisters with all purity. With all purity. You treat them, you don't... Uh, uh, do anything that's going to be suggestive or uh, would be inappropriate. And we talked again about a woman involved in leadership in a church that um, I always make sure when I'm talking to a young lady that my wife is somewhere nearby. I have never texted a, a woman to my knowledge about situations of any sort unless I copy my wife in that text and uh, she always knows and what I always I'm saying think to myself, and what I'm doing. Why is he copying me in on this? Because <laughs> I want you to he know. Because did you read that? I'm like, yeah, but I was like at the grocery store, you know. <laughs> but uh, always, whatever you do, you do it with purity. Uh, and when you're counseling, I remember the one of the elders early on in our church when we moved in here in 1989 said, let's put a nice window there, Pastor, so we can look into your office to make sure that when you're counseling a woman that... Um, you are uh, behaving yourself and uh, even open the door so that we know uh, that all is right. And that goes for children as well when you're dealing with little children. Uh, we have a policy downstairs. Uh, Kelly was asking uh, last week, we had one student in, uh, in um, Sunday school. I figured and, it out though. And Sadell <laughs> got another person. Instead of Sadell going down alone, she got another woman with her. Why? Because our policy, we never have a, an adult with a child. We always have at least two Even adults. Even if it's a woman. For, for accountability. Right. And again, because we're so wonderful, well, it's the insurance company's requirement. They do require that you have that as well. The insurance companies are very, very savvy because they're getting tired of nasty lawsuits. And it's uh, not only for protection of the children. We have to remember there's a lot of false accusations too that can happen to right. people. Because the devil is real. And so if he can, the devil, not only does he want to go after children, but he also wants to go after believers and right. non-believers. Yeah. So um, I remember my old church um, that was so, it was such a big deal because we had so many children and he used to bring that up on the pulpit a lot. Um, you know, if you ever touch a child in this church, I don't care how long you've been here, you will be prosecuted to the highest sure. extent of the law. We had so many little kids, but the devil can go after godly people too and, and, and use uh, false accusation. So I, I forgot <laughs> about that. That's, That's why right. you went down. And then the main thing is the protection of the, uh, of the individual, uh, the children, the, 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 the young ladies and young men. Uh, and, uh, and the churches have violated that. We talked about that. And uh, people have been marked for life because of the abuse. They have a sense of trust of those in ministry. And when those in ministry violate that trust, uh, it, it hurts them so deeply. Um, and uh, again, the, the, they get into lawsuits and, and people leave the faith and, and the churches, it's, it's bad. Well, another problem they had in those days was with the widows as far as how to take care of them. Mm -hmm. um, this we saw in the book of Acts when uh, some of the widows were complaining that they were not getting a fair share of the handouts of donations um, and of welfare. Uh, the, those Jews from the Grecian world uh, were complaining that favoritism was being given to those from Israel. The, the, the Jews from Israel, the, those ladies got better handouts than the Jews from Greece and elsewhere. And they complained about it. And the elders were very wise. They said, we're not going to be getting involved in this. It's important, but we're not going to take our time up with this. We're going to delegate it. You choose deacons yourself. We're not going to appoint them. You choose deacons who can take care of the handouts. And so they chose Stephen, they chose Philip and others. And uh, I think there were seven altogether. And they took over that. And the elders said, we are going to devote ourselves to the study of God's word, the teaching of God's word, and prayer. 
we will not be in, so the deacon's office uh, came about. And taking care of the widows is extremely important. But there were cases of abuse where they were putting the burden on the church. Remember they had no governmental intervention. They didn't have social security. They didn't have uh, uh, the, uh, the wonderful kinds of relief, small as they are. There's still places where you can go for food banks and things like that. Um, the burden was on the church. And yes, the church should be there in certain cases, but not all cases. Because in some cases, the widows had kids and grandkids, and they were being lazy, and they were not taking care of grandma. And there was, they were putting it on the church to take care of it. He said, no. Now, if you've got family, family takes care of family. We want the ones who have nobody else will take care of them. So let's read now uh, verses 3 to 16, talking about this problem of uh, the widows and how to support them and how to honor those who are truly widows. Verses 3 to 16. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the face, faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man. Well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she, ha if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently sh followed every good work. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow, wanton against Christ, they desire to marry having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. So he's dealing with a problem that was very, very prevalent then, and uh, to a lesser extent it's still uh, a situation today, but it gives us a lot of insight into how to manage the finances and how to provide for those who have uh, reached the status of um, uh, over 60 years of age in this case, he says, and widows. Let's go back to verse 3. Honor widows who are really widows, those who do not have anybody else to take care of them. Uh, and even with Social Security today, that, that is not, Social Security was never designed and cannot really meet all of our needs. It's supplemental to be sure, at best. Um, and so that alone is not going to sustain anybody. And so some folks are going to need extra help, and the church is to be there for those that are truly in that situation where nobody else can help them. And those widows are truly serving God and the church. Verse four, uh, verse 4, But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So kids and grandkids, uh, when necessary and appropriate, you take care of grandma. Uh, if nobody else is able to do that. And that goes for grandpa as well. Uh, if he doesn't have any other means, uh, his Social Security is not covering all the needs, he doesn't have a pension, or the pension is too small. Uh, and today in the economy, uh, senior citizens are finding that they're in a, a real pinch. Right now, the most difficult category, the newest category that's hurting financially is the seniors who are finding that their pension is too small, the, uh, Social Security is too little and the inflation is too great and they're really hurting. Some are going back to work. I was talking to a man the other day who uh, has been with the phone company for many, many years, mm -hmm. Verizon, and um, he has gone back to work. He's uh, well advanced in years and he and about five or six other men are uh, taking care of the Town of Colony uh, mm -hmm. golf course. Uh, love it. They have great fellowship and they work for minimum wage. They, they mow the lawns and they do the snow and that kind of stuff. 
And um, they're grateful to have a job. And grateful for it. Now, he, 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 he loves the fellowship and loves the exercise, but he's out. He starts work at 6:30 in the morning. He's not doing it just for fun, guys. He's doing it to help make the ends meet. Um, and so the economy is is tough, even for those. Uh, he's not a widow, a widower, but he was. Um, he was exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there, there come situations where people are going to have needs. We need to know how to take care of them, and the family needs to step up and help. Parents help kids, but sometimes kids have to help parents, for it's good and acceptable before God. Uh, verse five, honey. Now. She who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. That's the kind of widow we want to help. This is somebody who's truly a widow. We talked about Anna a few minutes ago. Luke tells us she was 84 years of age and she was there in the temple. She was praising God. She was there for the dedication of Jesus and she was telling people about the coming Messiah. And so these are widows who are uh, continuing in supplications and prayers night and day. They are very, very serious for the Lord. And uh, those that are really devoted to God, those are the ones who deserve to be helped Amen. by the church. On the other hand, verse 6. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. This is somebody who is just uh, in for pleasure, in uh, trying to meet their own needs. It doesn't have to be sexual pleasure, although there is an implication of that from the Greek. But uh, it can be just not really uh, serious about God, just having fun, and, uh, but needing support. Please help me, church. Uh, no, she's not really serious about the Lord, and so she needs to go elsewhere for her help. Uh, these things, verse 7, I want you to command the, for them to be blameless. In other words, they're not to be doing that which is wrong. Uh, verse 8 is important, and it really talks not just about widows, but I think just in general. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than a non-believer. That is so important. Read it again, would you please, honey? But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Unbelievers generally will provide for their household. Outside my office is a crabapple tree, and the birds, God bless them, are still there. Right now it's too cold and the nest is gone, and I'm not sure what they do. But come springtime, I'm going to see a, a male or two coming in and uh, some females, and those males are going to begin to start bringing in the twigs and the branches and stuff, the little things they need to make a nest. And most animals, uh, the females, are looking for males who are not necessarily sexy, but who are going to provide. Animals know how to look for mates who will provide for them. And women, they, 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 they do the survey of young ladies. What do you want most in a young man? I want a young man who has a sense of humor. Nonsense, girls, knock it off. A sense of humor. That's not going to hold too well when that you're is hungry. The, that's the truth, it though. It is true. That's, that's what they'll say. I want a sense of humor. Well, look yeah. it up. Google it. It's amazing. Honey, we can't pay the bills. We can't pay the mortgage here. But I'll tell you the one about the two guys that went into humor. the bar and the so on and so on. Forget about your humor. You're not so, we need help. And so you need to have somebody who will support. Unbelievers take care of their families generally, but some don't, and some believers don't either because they're too busy praying for God to send that perfect job. Somebody's going to knock on their door and say, hey, you want to make $100,000 a year? You can stay here. We'll send you the checks, etc." Come on, guys. There's an old song, one of my favorite ones from the 1950s. Get a job. sa -da -na -na, sa -da -na -na -na. Get a job. Yeah. Come on. Get off the, the duff. And there are so many people. We're complaining about the people from the South America coming through our borders. But we don't want to do any work here. They're, will they're willing so to the work. So these guys are willing to work. So let's let some of them in here to do some of the work because we're too perfect to get out and get jobs. Why do you think all the seniors are taking the jobs? Yeah. Number one, they need to. Yeah. But the other is there's nobody else to take the jobs. You look at any of your, 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 your trucks going by. They can, they can be electrical, plumbing, what have you. Help needed. Help needed. The younger generation, not to, not totally, no. but, but a lot of the young folks don't want to work, and they haven't found the right job yet. So they're not supporting their families. Shame on them. So an unbeliever knows how to take care of his family, and believers, you better take care of your family. And if that one job doesn't do it, then get a second job. And if two jobs don't do it, you will not die, get a third job, hopefully not three full-time jobs, but do what you have to. And I'll tell you what, the, I, know also, I know inflation's up, but they yeah. are paying good money out there. Right. And 
while you're working on three jobs, ask why you're working three jobs when the guy next to you is only working one job and God's meeting his needs because he's tithing. He's giving the first 10% to God and God's taking care of the other uh, needs that you might have. So start tithing, give the first tenth to God and get out and get a job. And let's not let those who are hungry go hungry. Take care of your family. We have too many cases. This is not just about widows. This is about young people. And it's been in our family and elsewhere too, mm -hmm. where people just don't want to work and they don't want to meet their needs. Well, then go hungry. Paul says elsewhere, you don't want to work, then you go hungry. But don't make your kids go hungry or somebody else mm -hmm. as well. All right, let's get more particular about the widows. We got some gals out there that mm -hmm. need help in this story. Verse nine. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number and not unless she has been the wife of one man. Well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has difficult, uh, diligently followed every good work. So they, uh, they, they thought that age 60 was, a, was older then, it seems, than now, but 60 was an age where they said, all right, if they're under 60, um, they, uh, they, they still have other options, and they don't, hey, have to, they, they don't need to go. <laughs> um, and uh, do not let a widow under 60 be on the, on the role, the role of support from the church. And so the church is not to support those widows who are under 60 because they have other options. They can get out and they can work, uh, even remarry. And uh, so the qualification is you're at least 60. Also, you have uh, been the wife of one man. In the Greek, that means a one man woman. It doesn't mean you had only one husband. Uh, another translation from the New Living Translation says she uh, has been faithful to her husband. So she's been a faithful wife. She's well reported for good works, verse 10. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, she's been a servant in other words. If she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. That's the kind of a qualification you're looking for if you're gonna be taking your widow onto the supportive role of the church. That's the kind of woman you wanna have in your life as well. Young women, older women. I wanna read this all right from the New Living Translation again. A widow who has been put on the list for support must be a woman who is at least 60 years old, was faithful to her husband. She must be well respected by everyone because of the good she has done. Has she brought up her children well? Has she been kind to strangers and served other believers humbly? Has she helped those who are in trouble? Has she always been ready to do good? Those are the kind of qualifications you want. Now back then, um, there weren't many, as many opportunities for women e either. So it's, it wasn't like they could go get a, store, a job down at the store or they could be a right. lunch lady or you know, pick up. I know we have a friend who's what, Pam is what, 62? Um, she's working three jobs and um, we invited her for Thanksgiving, she couldn't come. But she's working three jobs and she's 62 years old. Uh, I know. Working it's a double a, shift on Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know. um, and she works really, really hard because she doesn't want to get married again and she just wants to take care of what she needs to take care of. And so, but she works really hard. Um, she's not a professional, so she has to work a couple jobs. And, um, and you raise a good point. This is a woman who's not a widow. Uh, but uh, going through a divorce. Right. And this, this can go for divorcees as well. Uh, they're in the same kind of a position. Now, God has a very, very special uh, heart in the Old Testament and New for those who are widows uh, or, or divorcees, we could say today, for children and for aliens, for foreigners. And we have compassion on her. Yeah, we exactly. really are amazed with her. But the thing is, is back years, they didn't have the kind of opportunities. Right. You know, um, people, my kids say, when are you going to retire? Why would I retire? Yeah. Do you want me to sit in a chair and have my legs hurt? I get, they hurt as it is every day yeah, when I get up. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping I can live, work um, till I'm old, really right. old. <laughs> really oh, and old. by the way, this, this woman we're talking about here is very happy to have her three jobs, very happy to be doing this all by herself because of the life she had before. And for those churches that want to say, oh, she should never get a divorce, well, you want to look into the marriage that she had. The both of them Before were, yeah. you start to condemn right. people who've had a divorce, you start to, you know, God hates divorce. He also hates abuse and neglect. 
in, in marriages as well. So you have compassion. Stop trying to judge other people. And we're not here to judge. We're here to point them to Jesus and, and that. So churches uh, get off that uh, kick. You never get a divorce. And that's, she's that's lucky nonsense. that she can. She's blessed health-wise yeah. that she yeah. can work like that. That's right. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to verse 11. That this is as far as refusing who should not go on the church support role. Verse 11. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. So apparently these young ladies had said, I want to go on the rolls here because my whole life is devoted to Christ. He's everything for me. I love Jesus, so take care of me now and support me. Jesus is my everything. She's made a vow to serve the Lord, and then she doesn't follow through. Look at verse 13. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. So you're not busy praying and, and with supplications like we saw those gals over 60 years of age. You're not putting God first. You're being a busybody. You're on social media. You're just having fun and trashing this one and laughing about that one. Uh, no, we're not going to support you. And um, verse 14. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adver adversary to speak reproachfully. So that was Paul talking in his economy at that time because they really couldn't get jobs. Uh, today, uh, yes, they could remarry. Yes, they could uh, have children and, and uh, just behave themselves, but they could also go out and get jobs. They could go to Hudson Valley someplace else, get some courses and, and start uh, making uh, something for themselves. And this woman you're talking about just came on her own a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago at age 60, without that education and she's doing fine. So uh, be busy and uh, let's not be idle and let's not cause disruption. Um, verse 15. For some have already, already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. Very, very simple. If they have no other choice and they meet the qualifications 60 years and older, fine, put them on the, uh, the rolls and the church somehow try to manage it. But uh, otherwise, let the family members take care of them. And uh, that's, that's it for the, the, the burden of the, of the true widow in those Now, that days. doesn't mean you don't have compassion on someone. I know I've met people who are 60 years old, and there's no way they can do work. They're, they're sick. They had a hard life. They've had a lot of children. They lived in poverty. There are people that, and we need to encourage the oh, family, sure, those sure, children, those sure. grandchildren, to take care of that woman. Sure. You know. And there'll be cases where they're young, under 60. It could be somebody who's not able to work it's for some reason, age 20 or 30. Right. They have nobody else. Uh, obviously, uh, you're going to take care of those people and if there's nobody else to do it. Uh, the church is always there to step in when really, really necessary. But when there are others, family especially, step forward. And then he talks about church order concerning elders, verses 17 to 25. Uh, elders, in this case, meaning not just older people, but those who are leaders in the church. could be men or women. And um, he says, we, I, I love this scripture. It says you should pay them <laughs> and uh, also uh, necessarily discipline them if they've done wrong and then uh, make sure that you select them properly. So how do we take care of our leadership? Leadership in churches is so, so important. So let's read verses uh, 17 right through verse 25, dear. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident. Those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So in choosing elders for... Uh a church, leaders, 
the elders, verse 17, he talked about the qualifications of elders in chapter 3. And let's just go back and read that again, dear. This, he's talking here about men, but it applies to women as well. These are the qualifications uh, of your leaders in a church, and these are good examples for all of us to follow and, and to be in our lives. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7. There is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Amen. Now we're talking here about men in this context, but it applies to women. In the Greek, there's no uh, male, there's no uh, masculine uh, tense for the pronouns. It could be a man or a woman, but in those days, it was almost always men. Uh, a few exceptions then, and many more exceptions now. Uh, verse 1, the uh, man or the woman um, who desires that good work to be a leader, good. It's, it's a noble calling. That elder or that bishop should be blameless. In other words, um, sins are confessed and you're living for the Lord. The husband of one wife is literally a, a one-woman man or a one-man woman. In other words, you're faithful, you're temperate, you're sober-minded, good behavior, you're hospitable, you have the ability to teach. Uh, you're not given to wine. You don't get drunk. You're not addicted. You're not violent. You're not greedy for money. You're gentle. You're not quarrelsome. You're not covetous. You rule your own house well, and you have your children in submission with all reverence. If you can't handle your house, you can't handle the church. And incidentally, in those days, up and for the first 300 years after Christ, the church was in a house. And so if you were an elder, you invited folks over to your house or went to someone else's house. But your kids... Um, you didn't kind want the ki be. kids hanging from the chandeliers. That's exactly right. Yep. Uh, you're not a novice, not somebody who's new in the faith, because when you're a leader and you're new in the faith, you're, you're puffed up with pride and you'll fall into the same condemnation uh, as the devil because of his pride. And you have a good testimony not only within the church, but for those outside. You pay your bills, you treat people well, uh, you're, you're not a bad neighbor. And um, now, with that in mind, he says, let's treat these elders and let's take care of them because in many cases they're going to be working full time and they have to be supported. So verse 17 of chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. Let the elders who will rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So an elder should be receiving honors, in other words, should have support. And if they are ruling elders uh, and uh, teaching elders, then they should receive double honor, double pay, because they're working harder, and the job is extremely important. In our church, we have elders who are not only called elders, but they're ruling elders. They not only teach, but they also have authority. Pastor Kelly is a ruling elder, I am, and we have several others as well. Um, and then he gives the scripture about that, that you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And another one is the laborer is worthy of his wages. So the scripture there, the first one about the, the, the ox, muzzling the ox is from Deuteronomy. It's an interesting one. Uh, it's the picture of the ox who is strapped to a, a grinding mill to grind uh, the wheat uh, and separate the wheat from the, uh, the, the husk there. And uh, they, they put it into the lower millstone and the upper millstone is there and the ox is pulling it around and, and he's, uh, he's making uh, grain. And uh, he's entitled to reach down with his muzzle and eat some of that grain while he's working. And uh, so uh, it's certainly if you've got somebody who's uh, sharing the word and they're ruling in the church, that person should be paid and double pay if they're really taking on the role of ruling and teaching. Another scripture here is uh, uh, quoting right from the words of the Lord, uh, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Um, and then as far as accusations against an elder, it's one of the devil's tricks is to try to come against an elder, to speak ill of him. And uh, the qualification or standard for that is one that God uses in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, verse 19. 
Do not receive an accusation against an elder unless except from two or three witnesses. So not just one person saying, well, Pastor Jerry said this or Kelly did that. Uh, we need to get two witnesses or three before we can even hear the case. Otherwise, you've just got one person who's disgruntled with leadership making a false accusation or one that can't be proved or supported. And that's not right. That job is too important. We need two or three witnesses before we even hear the case. Now, if we hear the case and it turns out that that elder is sinning, then what do you do? Sweep it under the carpet, as the Southern Baptist Convention has been doing and as the Roman Catholic Church has been doing. And again, getting back to women, can you imagine women in those meetings at the Southern Baptist Convention or with the Pope and others sweeping it under the carpet? Can you imagine a woman looking the other way about a man who's been raping a woman? No, but those gals would be speaking up. Again, it's time to clean house and get to the, the female perspective on things. But in any event, if there is sin, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. It has to be an example. To whom much has been given, much is expected. And so if that elder has done wrong, that person needs to uh, be brought before the body and needs to be confessing it. And then whatever action is to be taken is, is up to that particular organization as led by the Lord. Uh, verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Wow. When you are bringing an elder before the body, it's not just you folks who are there. There are some others who are there as well. God is there. The Lord Jesus Christ is there. And the elect angels are there as well. They're all there for that proceeding. So be careful how you handle it. And observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. That's what the Roman Catholic Church has been doing, and the Southern Baptist Convention, and others as well. They have been looking at these cases, and they've always been men who have been doing it, and they've been treating it with partiality, and with prejudice, and sweeping it under the carpet. And God has been present, and Jesus Christ has been present, and the angels have been present for those proceedings. Be sure your sin will find you out. Oh, they did well on those occasions. They swept it under the carpet, and it didn't come out for years. But boy, has it come out years and years and years later. And uh, when it's, it's a bad reputation for the church. Very, very sad, not to mention the harm that's done to those people. One of the things you can do to help prevent a problem, it doesn't solve it totally, but if you want to help to get the right kind of an elder, verse 22. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. So don't lay hands on anyone hastily. Not a new person. That person, as we saw in from chapter 3, should be experienced. Been around for a while. And uh, there are elders out there who are in 22 and 23 and 24. Well, they've known the Lord for many years. They grew up in the house. And I'm not going to say they can't serve. But um, I hope they're seasoned. Because when you're 21, 22, your brain is not even fully formed, much less being able to lead a congregation and lead it you're in a way that's... You're making new brain cells to your 25. 25. 26. Well, I'm almost. trying to make new brain cells now. That's why I do crossword puzzles, but it's getting harder and harder. Anyway, don't lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Getting back to the Catholic Church and the Southern Baptist Convention as two big examples, and they are the biggest examples in the world as far as Christianity, so-called. They were sharing in their sins. There was a bishop who has been, right now has seven accusations against him and has had to step down and has left the priesthood. In two cases of, of uh, something he had done himself, they say, we don't know if it's true or not, but in the other cases, he didn't do it. But he oversaw it, and he swept it under the carpet. And so he shared in that person's sins. As far as they're concerned, it was as though that bishop himself had done it to that individual. 
And uh, that's why it's important when we do know something that we have to stand up for the truth because if you don't, it'll come back to you later on. And I think that's what happened. I read about it. I was reading about it, that he didn't want to discredit the entire, it's not that they were approved of it, but they didn't want to bring it out and they didn't want to discredit that's the right. entire clergy. That's right. So they tried to keep it under wrap and they would send people away and stuff. But, you know, you look back and you see how God just waited, probably just waited and waited, and then God blasted the doors open. Yeah. Because we can't hide things forever. They will eventually come seeping out of the cracks and they'll just break the doors down. And I think that's what happened. It's very sad. Oh, I just want to ask... I, I, hold your thought. Yeah. And I want to add to your thought. Uh, that is what was said about this, this bishop in the Roman Catholic faith, that it's also the position of those in the Southern Baptist Convention who were covering up. They did it to protect the convention. They did it to protect the name of the church. And now the church's name has been discredited. And certainly the Roman Catholic's name has been discredited in many cases. Go ahead with your next Well, thought. you know, the devil's behind all this. Now, people say, yeah, the devil made me do it. You know, um, the comedian used to say the devil made me do it, but the devil is still behind this, and so we need to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. But one of the questions I was just wondering, I don't recall a lot, I don't recall a lot of this in the synagogues, in, in uh, Judaism. Do we see a lot of this? We see a lot of no, the church. No, I, I really can't say that I have... Uh, and it just I, came to me. I, just, know, I wonder why. That's a good why. question. Why? I, I, there must be some cases. I'm not aware of any. It's not that rabbis are perfect, um, and, just, and, and if, if, their, if their record is, is better, uh, and it appears to be... So for what my, are they doing? Well, what, are, what are they doing that's right? Well, one of the things they're doing in our theme today about women, breaking the glass ceiling here, is there are a lot of female rabbis. And when you get a female, there's, you're much less likely to have a problem with sex. Uh, and uh, yeah, certainly among the Orthodox Jews, they have a very, very serious attitude about God's law. Uh, don't even set these, they separate, don't even worship with the women. They're so, so separate from them. They don't have the contact with the women uh, that, the, uh, that the pastors in the Catholic uh, faith and also the Protestants do. Bottom line, verse 22, keep yourself pure. Solve the problem right there. Keep yourself pure. Uh, we got a little med medical problem here, verse 23. For This is personal for Timothy. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So he had some frequent infirmities. If infirmities could be water-related. That's our general thought. The, the water was not as purified then as it is now. And so... Uh, Wasn't me wine used medicinal? Yeah. And so you take a little wine for your stomach's sake. It's not a, it's not a, a commendation to drink, although there is no... Uh, we saw this with, with, with uh, the elder. That doesn't mean you can't drink at all, but you don't want to get drunk. And if it, in those days, a little wine, uh, I guess the alcohol helped to purify the, the system. So drink that if it helps you to get rid of those stomach infirmities or whatever it was that bothered him. Um, as far as sins are concerned, verse 24. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. Oh, okay. So some sins are pretty obvious. We talked about that. It gets out there. Sometimes it takes a while, like some of these priests and some of these pastors. It took some time, it says 20 and 30 years, but it finally came out. And so that uh, actually preceded, they, they preceded them to judgment, and hopefully they confessed and, uh, and God has cleared them. But uh, others are going to be able to keep it secret. You're going to be able to keep your sin secret for the rest of your life, and nobody on earth is going to know what you did wrong. And if you're a believer, you're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ. Jerry Lynn, he helped a little old lady across the street, he did hospital visits, but on so-and-so occasion, he did the da 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 and all the six billion believers and angels are looking and saying, oh, right there at the judgment seat. Jerry doesn't lose his salvation, but that one goes up in smoke. Now for the unbeliever, again, you're going, to get, you're going to be saved from embarrassment all the way through life, all the way through the tribulation, all the way through the millennium until the white throne judgment when all of your works are brought before the angels and the believers and Jesus, etc. 
yeah, there's going to be a payday. So when you hear that, because I think of that, you know, you think of that, and you think you better really get yourself together. Get you, yourself together. You don't want to. Forgive me, Lord. You don't want to carry that. So repent. And so. Repent. You don't want to so, take it with you. Yeah. You don't want to be That's embarrassed. Right. And, and if you confess it, as Kelly there. says now, you're forgiven now. God is not into double jeopardy. And stop doing it. If you it. ask forgiveness and you stop doing it, he's not going to bring it up at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Uh, and the good work, uh, good works, verse 25, and now we're closing. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So <clears throat> you're doing good works. Could I tell you how wonderful I am? Could I tell you all the great things that I do? The Pharisees were doing that, and Jesus said, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You guys are blowing your own trumpet about what you've done. Hi, I did this, I did that. Enjoy the praise. Enjoy the, the clapping. That's all you're going to get. You're going to get nothing in heaven. On the other hand, you do your work secretly so that nobody knows it. Nobody knew my good works. Well, wait till you get to the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. And now, Jerry Lynn did so-and-so. He was on his knees at 3 o'clock in the morning praying, and nobody knew it, but this is the result of it. Wow. And wow, up there in heaven. And here's a crown, Jerry, wow. for what you did. Wow. So the good works, you can get them here. Now, if, they, if somebody just happens to notice it, that's fine. I remember once when I was in a Pentecostal church in the early days, and they, they would get the camp meeting, and they had the music going, and they'd say, now, for those who are going to give $1,000, come forward. And this I was like 50 that. years ago. I remember that. And they'd come that. forward. And here is so-and-so, and he gave $1,000. Yay! Enjoy that applause. That's it. That's your reward. Wow. That's it. Because you, <clears throat> you milked it here for others, and God says, you've already had your 10 seconds. You're not going to get it in heaven. No, do your works in secret, and then he'll reward you openly. Amen? Good practical advice, and uh, let's close in prayer, shall we? Yes. Thank you, Father, for this word. <clears throat> Help us truly to be changed, to be convicted, be changed by it. Help us to live our life in purity and holiness without praise, looking to get praise from you, Lord, in secret. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Until the next time. Shalom. Shalom. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Return.